All right, so we're live. Um, yeah, uh, thanks so much for tuning in today. So this is the second time that we're doing this. We're organizing kind of a discussion to talk about some of the interesting questions around Cosmos. There's so many open questions, and I think it's important to have this kind of forum to explore them. Uh, we've had quite a few people submitting questions to us on uh, Telegram, on Reddit, on Twitter. So we'll try to get to some of those. There's also a live chat, so oh, uh, there's also uh, the ability to, you know, chat on the live stream. So feel free to submit, you know, additional questions there, and we can try to get to them. Um, yeah, and of course the, the recording is going to be afterwards on on YouTube as well. And so let us know what you think. So yeah, with that, uh, let's get started. Just just briefly about myself. So. Uh, I'm Brian Crane. I'm from uh, from Course One. We're one of the validators uh, on Cosmos. If you want to learn more about us, there's going to be a link in the in the description. Uh, and I also used to used to be part of the Cosmos team, uh, so I used to work you know closely with Sunny there, and well, of course of Epicenter too. So, uh, but yeah, so I'm really happy that we have a, a bunch of great great participants. And so yeah, let's let's make some introductions. Maybe Charlie, why, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, sure. So my name is Charlie Morris. Uh, I'm the co-founder of a venture capital fund called CMCC Global. Uh, we were founded in 2016. We currently manage three funds and we have offices in Hong Kong uh, and Toronto. Uh, and as a disclaimer, we were investors in the Cosmos ICO in 2017. And uh, Jack, I mean, you probably don't need too much introduction since you're already no. master of the Cosmos live stream, but still. <laughs> uh, my name is Jack Samplin. I'm a product over here at Cosmos. Uh, I've been working a lot on launch uh, and in the SDK primarily, uh, helping grow adoption of Cosmos. And uh, hey uh, my name is Sunny. Uh, I'm one of the uh, researchers at Cosmos. Um, and I've been I did a lot of the design of most of the uh, economic uh, design that's currently there on the Cosmos Hub. So looking forward to chatting about that. And then I also uh, co-run a validator called uh, Sika. Oh, I also run a validator. Mine's Jack Samplin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so I thought the way we could start this is by just going around. And people can basically, because there, there's so many open questions, right? There's things around centralization, there's things around, you know, fees, about slashing penalties. There, you know, there are like dozens of open questions, different parameters. So I thought what would be interesting if you just, just go around and each person can kind of share, you know, what's the what's the one question or area of econo cosmos economics that they're think the most about you know they think they're going to be most important maybe most concerned about so yeah let, let's let let's do that so maybe charlie why don't you go ahead yeah i, I mean i think that the biggest concern as an investor is that um basically the atoms end up not having any value or not having much value and, and i think almost you know the, the there is obviously the chance that the whole network could fail but almost what would be sadder would be if the cosmos ecosystem is highly valuable has all sorts of incredible you know popular um, hubs on it and yet there is just not that many kind of transactions flowing through the hub and so you know the the atom holders basically uh, are not really accruing any fees um i think that's kind of and, and i think to be honest that's something that we're not really going to know until a lot of this is out in the world yeah no that's that's definitely a very uh massive question i think something we yeah. should definitely talk about today but uh, maybe 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 one other point just from the yeah. investor perspective which would be particularly interesting given that you're all running validators is as an investor it's very difficult to um assess the quality of validators you know and i we my team has spent a lot of time speaking to a lot of different validators and we get you know very similar answers to all the questions and so you know how can the community kind of assess the quality of validators. I'd be interested to kind of get your, your guys' take on that. Yeah, and, and by quality of validators, you specifically mean like how secure is their setup? Or are you what, what exactly do you mean when you speak about quality of validators? Yeah, I mean, I think I think security of setup is is key. Um, and this and then this moves into another question around slashing, which I'm sure we'll get onto. Um, but you know, obviously, as an investor, if I'm putting my LPs funds at stake, 
um, by by you know delegating to some to some validators, I need to be very confident um, in the security of that system. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, what about you, uh, Jack? Sort of dovetailing with what uh, Charlie just said there, how what I'm really interested to see, and this is kind of obviously still an unanswered question, is how value is going to flow through IBC between different chains and different hubs. Because some some zones, obviously, if you think of applications like gaming or you know, maybe somebody collater collateralizes a real world asset on the blockchain, like those zones will kind of generate value that will throw, flow throughout the ecosystem. How that ends up happening and, and where there's value capture or value created. And that's very pertinent to Charlie's concern of how do we ensure that some of that value does end up accreting in the hub. Okay, okay. And uh, what about you, Sunny? Um, I'm having trouble deciding between two of them, so I'll just say both. Um, the first is uh, this idea called partial slashing, which is a way of, you know, the larger, you know, we see this problem right now where there's a couple of validators that are very, very large on the Cosmos Hub. And so how can we incentivize decentralization of that? And so one such tactic is something I call, we call um, partial slashing. And I've talked about this at length with like uh, Vitalik and Dan Robinson and a lot of other people. Uh, the larger a validator is, if they, uh, if they fault, they get slashed more. So a validator of like 20% voting power or 10% voting power gets slashed way worse than someone of 0.1% voting power. And so this kind of gives a natural incentive for people to delegate away and to like smaller validators who maybe have similar security to some of these larger ones. So that's one. Um, and then the other is uh, just this uh, pool security. So, you know, we see a lot of, of questions coming up lately around like, how does the Cosmos Hub's pool security going to differ from like polka dots and whatnot. And so um, I don't know this might be a bit controversial, but in my opinion, the Cosmos Hub really will get its like will see its true value once it starts offering pooled security features. And so, kind of, a, me and Zaki have just been spending some time lately, like thinking through and designing some of these pooled security features. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll just add my own thoughts. I mean, I, I certainly agree, right? That the question of how will the hub, like, how will Adams capture value, is like a, a very interesting, complex question. Uh, and definitely one I also uh, think about, I mean, and, and that sort of ties into, I think I, I also, of course, one we've also been speaking a lot about the question of shared security. And then I guess shared security sort of from, from two angles. First of all, from the angle of how do you help new zones bootstrap and launch? Because I think that's a, you know, that's a difficult problem. And and then you know how does that translate into value also for for the hub? And then I think some sort of using the security of the hub to you know lend on other chains is definitely like an interesting direction. And you know one one aspect one one way and may, maybe that's also one thing we we could speak about now. Or the, um, yeah, no, actually, let, let's come back to that later. Um, so. So what do you guys, so is this scenario that you guys are wor worried about that basically the cosmos succeeds, there are many zones, there are many hubs, many, maybe many hubs, so maybe just, maybe there's few hubs, but, uh, but you know, basically a few transactions go through it. And then if you have a sort of discounted cash flow on these transaction fees, then that in the end amounts to little value and you know in the end it's sort of okay cosmos was a great project dave you maybe cosmos sdk was popular tenement was popular but you know in the end the the cosmos hub kind of either didn't deliver because a hub isn't the right uh, isn't actually something to capture value or maybe there's a binance becomes a hub Right, and by them having an exchange on the hub, they're actually maybe in a better position to be a hub. Are that are these kind of like some of the fears? I think that some of the, the, sorry, 
Yeah, I, I think some of those concerns are, sorry, Charlie. <laughs> I'll no, let no, you yeah, go yeah, first. Yeah, yeah. No, no. Okay. I think some of those concerns are really valid, but I think that we do have to think about technical limitations. If you're running a decentralized exchange, that's going to be a super heavy chain and then also managing a lot of cross-chain transfers. Like, is that practical from a technical perspective in the short term? I don't know. I, I think that some of these problems are going to be larger problems than we think they are, but a lot of them are probably going to be smaller. Anyway, sorry, Charlie. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, you know, I, definitely the, the the idea of like, you know, Binance creating its own hub and that taking away from the Cosmos hub is, is definitely a concern. And I do think there are going to be some serious network effects that happen here. And one way I've been thinking a little bit about this is, is kind of by analogy, um, in medieval Britain, there were weekly markets held in some towns. And what would happen is the lord of the manor would charge a tax to all of the, the traders who would come to this market. Uh, and this tax was a guarantee for the security of the traders in the, you know, in medieval Britain, it was a bit of a dangerous place and that you could get easily robbed if you were trying to trade somewhere else. And this to me is exactly what the Cosmos Hub is. You know, the Cosmos Hub is this marketplace. The Lord of the Manor owns all of the atoms um, and, and receives all of the taxes. And so in the Cosmos ecosystem, if you hold atoms, you know, you're eligible rec to receive this tax as long as you're providing the security. Now, the risk here is, you know, that we've created this structure and now, you know, Binance over in another town in Wales basically says, actually, you know, we've got a much bigger market. More traders are going to come to us um, and, and that you, you end up with this kind of network effect where everyone wants to go to where the Grand Bazaar is. And that is the Cosmos Hub not going to end up being the Grand Bazaar. Um, and that's definitely a fear. I, 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 yeah, I don't know if you, if you guys have have any kind of theories as to how you can make sure the Cosmos Hub is the Grand Bazaar in medieval digital land. Um, so some of the ideas I have around here are one is build some lightweight, uh, useful functionality into the hub. So you know, I think building a large scale DEX is not like what the hub is meant for. But like maybe a Uniswap plugin, for example, a Uniswap is a very simple, like lightweight thing that people could use to quickly go between asset types. That seems like something that would be useful on the hub. Um, another one is, you know, I have this so, design. So that would run on the hub itself, not on some sort of, you know, zone connected to the hub. Yeah, exactly. Because Uniswap is such a simple, like lightweight thing and that it's like, you know, it's, I think, I think, you know, it's my thought. I think it's reasonable to have a Uniswap plugin in the hub where people are going through the hub and, you know, while you're there, you might as well make a pit stop at the Uniswap plugin and just swap your coin and then continue going on with what you want to do. Um, another like interesting, like, uh, you know, uh, like thing that the hub can provide is I have a design for how you can pay your transaction fees on any other chain, uh, be your monetary assets on the hub. So let's say there's a crypto kitties chain or something, right? Uh, but you don't want to move your BTC and like at money onto that chain because you don't know how the security of it is, but you can still pay your transaction fees on that chain with, while keeping your money on the hub. That's another, like uh, value that the hub can provide. Um, and then really, like I said, at the end of the day, I think it will come down mostly to shared security and how many chains are willing to do shared security with the hub. Um, oh, and then I guess one, actually one, one more last thing is currently uh, the design with IBC is that they charge fees based off of like, you know, the number of transactions going through and just off of like normal transaction fees that we're used to in the, in the blockchain ecosystem. But actually, I think in the long term, really what the Cosmos hub validators are doing is a decentralized custody, right? Like they're, they're custodying assets and they're a decentralized custodian. Um, and so, you know, custodians generally, you know, they take on more risk, more assets, their custody, custody, the valuable assets they're custodying. And so you, you traditionally charge fees based off of a percentage of the assets custody. And I think that's something that the Cosmos Hub validators might have to move into where you're not charging like based off of the number of transactions going to the hub, but you're really saying that, oh, the Cosmos Hub validators are custodying like a billion dollars of BTC this year. Like, you know, we need to charge 0.1%. I don't know what the percentage is, but you know, it, it might have to turn into a percentage model.
But so let's say I, I have some ether, you know, and, and now there is, there's an ether bridge, right? So I move my ether through the cosmos hub to crypto kitties zone or like some zone. And, and that, that, that blockchain doesn't connect directly to Ethereum, but through the cosmos hub. So I move it through that. And now I'm, I'm in there and I'm playing these games and then I would pay like some percentage of the assets to the cosmos hub. No, like, it's not you as a user aren't the one who has to do it. It'll be happening in the, you know, what will literally just be happening is that like all the ETH that's your share of what you have is a share of the custodied ETH pool, right? And so over time, the ETH pool, like the validators can pull from it, like very slowly, right? Like I'm talking about like, you know, less like a one, like well, less than 1% a year, right? And so, but yeah, so basically, you know, you'll, you'll take your share of the ETH pool, move it to the CryptoKitties chain and like do whatever yeah. you want there. But when you go back, maybe what, when you had one ETH, now you have 0.999 ETH when you're, when you, when you take it back to the Ethereum chain. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I guess so. I guess that the risk there, though, is that if people know that they're being taxed on the assets that they hold, they will just not store it on the Cosmos Hub, and then the you know you you know they'll yeah store it on the on the Ethereum chain or on whatever you know whatever other chain is not charging that fee. Right. Totally, totally agree with you, Charlie. I, I think one thing that might be interesting to bring into this this, this discussion is the idea of the community pool what are some things that this network of users could vote for that could potentially help drive more economic value? Like as opposed to thinking about in protocol or like large protocol changes, like what are some things where, how could we use and leverage the community pool to bring more users and usage onto the chain? Yeah. So I, I, I think that's a great question. And I think I, it, it points very much to the way I think about you know, what is Cosmos and, you know, even, even with something like Bitcoin, people would say, oh, Bitcoin was like the first DAO and it has this kind of characteristic, right? It has this monetary function, it rewards miners to do this work. And then it has all of these users, but you know, the issue is the decision-making process of Bitcoin as a DAO is just like not very good. And this is the same with Ethereum. But now we have uh, actually, I think Cosmos governance so far is working pretty fantastic. You know, I think it's early and I'm sure there's lots of improvements to do, but you know, I think so far uh, I'm personally very pleased with it. So I think what we are, so that's, I think also the way to think about it for me, you know, Cosmos basically a DAO, right? And so I think the community pool is a really fantastic mechanism that, uh, you know, this collective can, you know, decide what to do with it. And if you think back to, uh, you know, the DAO, I mean, I was skeptical when the DAO came about because I just didn't really think that this would be a good way of making decisions, like have this massive collective make investment decisions together. So I was, you know, in, in the end, we never saw actually whether it would have been a good way or not. But what we definitely saw is there was just this enormous, um, enormous dynamic and engagement with the system and enthusiasm and the such speed that unfolded. You know, it lasted only like four weeks until the thing collapsed. You know, it was a very short time. But in that short time, I mean, the number of people like working on it and building tools and explorers, etc., it was just explosive. And I think that was because of this. DAO characteristics, and I think the Cosmos Hub has the potential of that too. And it's, and I think that's in a way the biggest potential of Cosmos is to become this super dynamic ecosystem and community that you know is actually is able to make decisions effectively. And uh, and then I think if that happens, I'm pretty optimistic that you know we'll find ways to create something valuable and great. Yeah, Brian, that's, that's what has me super optimistic is seeing the enthusiasm and the power of the community and like, what is a currency of any type if it's not the people who value and, and use that currency? So I, I think that <clears throat> we will see the community step up and answer some of these questions. Sorry, something. Uh... Oh, um, what I was just going to say is 
is um, if anyone has listened to our my uh, uh, epicenter episode from a few weeks ago on DX DAO, kind of uh, with Martin Kopelman and Matan Fields from DAO Stack, and you know they were kind of making this pitch of how this DX DAO will become this like large global organization that owns DeFi that, that runs a lot of DeFi platforms. And so, yeah, I mean, you know, I completely think of a proof of stake validator set as a, as a DAO. And I think that the Cosmos Hub validator set seems to be at, at the moment, like, you know, I, they're, they're a DAO, but they're also a way more like, uh, you know, competent DAO in that they've like proven that they are able to carry, carry out like large scale coordination stuff, such as launch a public blockchain, where I think out of all the DAOs in existence, such as, you know, whether we're talking about Moloch DAO or DX DAO or the Cosmos Hub Validator set, I think the Cosmos Hub Validator set is proving itself as of now to be the most competent and like versatile DAO in existence. Yeah, I think one thing that's been really positive to me is, is when the first token transfer vote was kind of, you know, started voting on and then got voted down, I think, one of the important things with any DAO, as with most countries, is actually having slow moving, kind of careful steps tends to lead to greater stability than like rapid movement. Um, and so, you know, I just hope that as Cosmos evolves, you know, lots of these things come up, but there is still kind of a relatively slow and careful progression in terms of decision making. Charlie, totally agree with you and just want to give some more, a little bit more color as to why we were <laughs> trying to get that transfer vote to happen. Uh, we had done a lot of testing on that code and uh, prior to launch, we had kind of, that the messaging was, we're going to launch this and then we're going to do the vote and we're going to upgrade it. Um, so I think that that was, that was the reason for the rush. But I do think that everyone I've talked to in the community also views this sort of slow moving governance in, in more thoughtful decision making is absolutely crucial to the platform's success. So uh, yeah, just wanted to say that. Yeah, so I think what's interesting to speak about now, and actually we have some comments in the chat too that sort of tie into this is, and, and I think that's at the crux of this, you know, because if we previously, the the thing you said, Sonny, right, about, okay, the Cosmos Heart will like charge some percentage of the assets. Can it do that or can it not do that? Well, the, the key question is really, you know, how much value does it provide? And does it provide, you know, is it sort of a replaceable thing? If it charges too much, somebody else creates a hub and people just move there, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So if you have, you know, it, are they really strong network effects? And so what uh, Matt Bell uh, here, you know, what he says, I'm optimistic about Adams because I think the cost of building a quality validator set is hard enough. And, you know, you have this natural shelling point of the validator set. And then, so that's kind of one thing, right? The quality of a validator set. And I think that very much ties into shared security, right? Because if you if you yeah. now need a validator set and the best validator set is getting the Cosmos Hub, and then you go there and say, okay, kind of have this validator set and, and basically pay uh, for the Cosmos Hub validator set to operate a chain. So that's, that's definitely one. Um, just, just on on that yeah. on that point, Brian. Though I mean, you you guys are all running validator sets. You know, are you all looking to run them on Iris as well? So we're not we, running. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, at least on course one side, we're not running on Iris like right now. But you know, we definitely, uh, you know, we will definitely run validators on many different chains in the kind of Cosmos ecosystem. I mean, the first one we were doing already kind of Loom, right? Which is also built on Tenement. Okay, it's, it's a little bit different. It's not built in Cosmos SDK, it's just high, but still it's, uh, you know, they're I mean, also I, planning to connect with the Cosmos hub. I, I guess my, my, my point is, I think a lot of the high quality validators in order to be economically feasible are gonna have to operate on multiple different hubs. And so we are gonna see the same high quality validators on multiple, in multiple locations. I think that's partially true, but I think that each high quality validator also needs to get a large number of delegators and the chances of all of these validators having huge stakes on all of these chains, I think is going to be relatively low, which is going to lead to a large number of strong validator operators within the ecosystem. Also, every chain doesn't have the same security model. We don't all need as many validators as we can have and to have everything as decentralized as possible. The design of the Cosmos Hub is to be that way so that it can be 
this sort of like neutral interchange market that's guarded by the security of this super strong validator set. But, you know, if let's say there's a regional co-op of corn farmers that want to collateralize their corn and sell futures on that or something crazy, each of the corn farmers could <laughs> run their own validator and they would have stake in that network proportional to their crop yields that year. However, they design the incentive sets. So that's a very different validator set that would connect via IBC and maybe not necessarily need that shared security. They're finding security within their own community. And I think we're going to see a lot more of that as the network gets larger and larger. So, yeah, I just wanted to kind of respond to your point, Charlie. Um, so I think it, it's it's true, of course, that you know, some other chain comes and, you know, maybe they get some of the same value. But like, if you, you know, what does, what makes a good validator like on Cosmos or, or like what makes the Cosmos validator community good? I think it's that they're really quite deeply engaged with the project. And, you know, if let's say now there's some new proposal about, you know, issuing tokens on, on the hub. Now, is this a good idea or not? Uh, it's, a, it's a difficult question, right? So this will, will require a lot of like really engagement with this thing. And I don't think it's possible to scale that very well. Like you can go on like lots of chains and say, okay, I run a node on that. But I don't think that has like that, you know, that has value for the chain, but it's it's not going to get you the same kind of vibrant community. Yeah. And, and Brian, to, to sort of dovetail on that point, I don't, I think the question is not what are good validators. I think good validators are going to be profitable validators on the chain because they they are incentive aligned with that chain to keep it running. So, like, how many profitable validators can any individual chain support is the real question. And I, I think that sort of co-op use case I was mentioning, some of those network participants are likely going to be running theirs at a loss for a little while, while the economic value that that chain secures comes onto the network in, in bootstraps. So, this is a much more complex problem with a lot of sort of um, differentiation points for validators in sort of at the beginning of this conversation that was one of the key points you brought up is how do validators differentiate themselves and like how do delegators know who to validate to um so yeah anyway i'll stop there i think actually brian i think that's a really nice point you know it seems to me that validators have more than just technical capital they have intellectual capital and where they place their intellectual capital is probably going to be where value accrues Question to Jack, um, you know, these corn farmers, do you think corn farmers have the ability to run like highly technical proof of stake validators? Aren't they going to end up just going to these companies like Chorus and Certus and whatnot and saying, hey, can you run our validators on our behalf? So farmers already run server installations in a lot of cases to support networked farm equipment on their farms. Uh, there's a lot of technical information about how to run a secure validator online in the cost. If you already have internet in a server rack is relatively de minimis. So I, I do think in that case, those corn farmers likely would. Cool. Thanks. Um, I guess, oh, to an go back to really quickly to the question about, um, you know, will about the, uh, the charging by percentage, um, you know, I think that's going to be need to be necessary to make a profitable hub because uh, I just gave a talk at the Interledger Summit uh, like last week, last Friday, kind of talking about how you can use Interledger or Atomic Swaps to basically, in my opinion, heavily uh, improve the UX of using Cosmos, but specifically by avoiding going through the hub too much and you you kind of uh a top ilp uh send your coins from chain from chain to chain so you can move uh you can use ilp or atomic swaps to send btc from the dex chain to the prediction market chain and i think this will have a slightly better ux for uh users than trying to go ibc through the hub but this comes at the cost but this also means that i'm trying to reduce the number of transactions that are hitting the hub every time and so given that, you know, if, if the goal, you know, I, I think we're, like, I, I, we're balancing two things here, which is like, I'm trying to make the UX better, but that also, if you're just charging based off of transaction fees, that's not going to be reducing the profitability of the hub. But 
and and really, you know, what the validator set is doing is custodying assets. And so, like, you know, the more assets they're custodying, they're taking on way, 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 way more risk. And I think any validator set that starts to like that, you know, any hub has to start to switch to like a percentage based model. So since you're speaking about uh, this question of uh, kind of capital and custodying assets, one of the things that I I find interesting is that, you know, right now, let's say somebody uh, stakes 100 atoms. Um, the only thing that's actually like at risk, they could potentially lose are basically five atoms, right? Like in case they're validated double science, they lose five atoms, they get, you know, so that's so basically what it means is that 95 of those atoms, they're illiquid, right? They can't move them, but they're not at risk. So does that make sense? Like, I guess there could be a whole variety of, you know, sort of other directions this could go in, right? Like you could potentially say, hey, we actually say, we actually have like 100% slashing ratio, right? So you'd be, so then it doesn't make, um you know so it's it's in a way it's more capital efficient right so now probably the percentage bonded will be much lower um and you know the risks are higher that could be one model uh i don't know if there's some sort of model where you'd say you have like you're staking the atoms now you get some other token that you can transfer but it you know it, it's almost like a validated bond uh i guess a third model could be that okay I'm, I'm staking my 100 atoms, five of them are at risk on the Cosmos hub for the behavior there, but maybe another 10 of them are at risk for chain, uh, you know, mm -hmm. or maybe 50 atoms are at risk for a whole bunch of other chains, right? And mm -hmm. I, I think that the last one is probably the most interesting mm -hmm. and promising direction, but um, what are you guys thoughts on that and also on, on this on this number actually five percent slashing penalty is that the right number so that five percent is a is extremely small and it was chosen to be extremely small just to begin the network uh the premise was that you know i think our thought there was that if there if, if a validator double signs uh early on in like the first couple of weeks i'm willing to put there to be it's like a 30% chance it was their fault and 70% chance it was probably a bug in the code. And so that's why we're being somewhat lenient right now. And over time, that 5% should be cranked up. Um, and the way it should be cranked up, I think, is using that thing I was mentioning earlier, which is partial slashing, where the percentage of the slash is based off of how big a validator is. So if you're a so if you have a validator at 30 who has 33% of stake, that's when you should get slashed a hundred percent because you know, that's when you're, you're able to cause the Byzantine fault, but let's say you have 1% of stake, maybe you get slashed, you know, a smaller percentage. And, um, and the other thing you also have to do is also have it slashed by number of validators that fault at the same time. So, you know, other, you know, because let's say I have a large validator of 10%, then what I would just do is split them up into smaller validators into 10 separate validators of 1% each. Right. But, what, so then what I want to do is that if like multiple values adding up to 10% fault at the same time, as, that gets slashed way worse than one validator of 10% faulting. So now this gives a further disincentive for you to like split them apart because if they're accidentally correlated and I can get you to double sign uh, those correlated validators, like, you know, you're in for a world like hurt because it's going to slash you a lot. In that case, and so Dan Robinson and I, Dan Robinson and I, uh, came up with a decent uh, function that basically m hits the, what we want to, um, and you know it's based off of a lot of like the things that, you know if you ever read a lot of Vitalik's like quadratic voting and quadratic funding and all that stuff. So we have this nice little quadratic equation. I don't know, we don't know what the constants should be yet, but you know the, the general form of the equation seems about right. I think one thing that's also pertinent to this discussion is staking derivatives, i.e. how to make staked atoms a little bit more liquid. And if this slashing number is very low, shouldn't validators be able to offer derivatives on top of their staked atoms? So, so that's something I've been thinking about a lot. And I think that that is almost definitely going to happen in the longer term, because what I can see happening is a lot of big exchanges 
basically, you know, bonding their own atoms potentially onto their own validator, but then still offering trading of those atoms. And one of the things that I think is kind of particularly interesting there is that when you start having derivatives, it kind of abstracts away the risk of different validators. And that's a real concern because actually when you have different you know, atoms being bonded with different validators, there's a different risk level on those different atoms. And so those atoms actually don't really become fungible anymore because maybe I really trust, you know, Coinbase's validator because they, you know, put loads of money into it. And maybe I don't really trust someone else's one man shop validator. And all of a sudden we have atoms that potentially are no longer fungible. Um, yeah. So that that's that's kind of the argument against atom derivatives. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, no, I, I, I mean, if you did derivatives, then they clearly would not be fungible, right? Like, I mean, I, I think that the, the sort of uh, traditional financial instrument that feels like the most analogous is like a bond, right? Where, okay, there is some sort of more or less uh, fixed income type revenue stream, but then there's also a default risk, and that's you know idiosyncratic to you know whoever you've delegated to, and then and that will vary. So I, yeah, I don't think you can just yeah. So they wouldn't be fungible, absolutely. Well, hey guys, I'm selling Adam CDOs. We're taking all this risk and we're slicing it up into tranches. Who's interested? <laughs> yeah, you could do that. Sure. Nice. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, that I actually do foresee someone doing that where they take a bunch of. About atom bonded atoms from a lot of different validators and put them all into like one one asset that kind of like is backed by a bunch of different validators that bonded atoms. Um, another thing though is I I mean I as a as a developer of this I'm trying to I'm at least for the short term my goal is to try to make it as difficult as possible to uh, create like derivatives of at staked atoms that you know I want to give the market an opportunity to um, you know mature. And until then, like, for example, right now, like, you know, it'll be very, I, I want to make it difficult to create uh, derivatives in a trustless manner. Like, you know, if Coinbase wants to go ahead and do it based off the atoms in their system, yeah, I, I, I literally can't do anything about it because people are willing to just like trust this company at all ends, like give them millions of dollars. But like, you know, in, in a trustless way, like, you know, that, you know, the Cosmos Hub doesn't have smart contracting capabilities. Um, there, there, there are things you can do to make it harder to make uh, staking derivatives, and so the idea is I want to like make it harder as long as possible in order to allow like more education around staking tokens and the risks involved to proliferate before these derivatives start entering the market. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the the sort of flip side of this would be that you know exchanges have this very interesting and powerful position in a way in that they can offer like liquidity and potentially the staking interest at the same time and so if you want to have you know uh, like um a validator set that's more independent and you know you don't want to have this outsized advantage for exchanges then you know solving this liquidity issue you know in a decentralized way without somebody having actual full custody of it and staking it you know that's a that's a valuable thing to do um when we get into a world of dexes do you think this will be resolved somewhat and like you know i guess you know really no it's not that. right because because the issue is uh in like i have some atoms i'm staking the atoms well, a, a DEX is not going to support me trading those atoms, right? Like, I, I mean, at least there would need to be some kind of change on the Cosmos hop that I get maybe some sort of representation that can move into DEX and trade while it's still being staked or something. But I think it would require changes on the, on the Cosmos hop to do that. Otherwise, the only way to do it is, hey, you know, I'm Coinbase, I have the private key, I'm staking it, and hey, it's, I can obviously uh, still allow trading it. And uh, and there's nothing that Cosmos Hub can do to prevent that, uh, and you know that's obviously going to happen. Um, but uh, but if for, for Dex will not be able to do the same thing, at least not in the current design of the Cosmos Hub. So uh, 
interesting discussion on DEXs. One of the community questions that came in was about uh, arbitrage front, uh, front running opportunities on Cosmos based chains, talking about uh, the recent Flash Boys 2.0 paper that came out. Basically, these are kind of selfish mining attacks uh, on Ethereum to support and include specific transactions. And I know, or Sonny looking at me like I'm wrong, could be wrong there. But uh, I do know that there is some. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I do know that there are some proposer-based attacks on Cosmos that might be able to simulate some of this stuff, and I was wondering if you guys had any thoughts on that. Um, when it comes to front-running, you know, as of until now, the premise of the Cosmos um, Cosmos as uh, of Tendermint was let's give everyone an equal opportunity to front-run. So, you know, instead of giving, you know, that was the main innovation of Tendermint over PBFT is that it allows this rotating proposer and every block has a new leader. And so, you know, we rotate the proposer. So, and it, so that way it's harder for front run. Um, I haven't read Phil's paper yet, but you know, the, the really the best solution here is uh, if you have a, I don't think most applications need this because front running, I don't know how, what, how many applications it actually affects, but like for applications that are legitimately affected by it, um, what, what will, you know, what, one of the modules I want to build into the Cosmos SDK is a, like dark pool of pending transactions. So you basically, uh, validators have a threshold decryption key where you send in an encrypted transaction. The encrypted transaction is included on chain and then the validators threshold decrypted. And so this prevents anyone from front running it, even the proposer of the block, because they don't know the content of the transaction until it's been committed to, and then only will they threshold decrypted. Yeah, I mean, I, I just read the other day that Binance has in their documentation, they have like a page on, you know, front running, front running on the Binance decks. And uh, I think they make a pretty coherent argument that, you know, this is, you know, on, you know, they, they have a bunch of measures, you know, one is just a fast block time, like the blocks are so fast and then every block is final, right? So like you, you have a, like, a, tiny tiny amount where we'd have to like basically try to you know take that uh, transaction out of mempool put a different one in and then i think they have another bunch of stuff that they're doing there to make this uh you know even harder so i it feels to me that i'm not sure how big this problem is going to be practically or i think it's going to be a problem when you have you know large decks and you know it's a problem like three years down the line and i'm sure there will be a lot of different solutions to that problem too uh, so i'm curious so jim jim yang asked a, a question which i think is interesting so he says basically okay you don't want your internet to be run by google facebook but you want interchain neutrality platforms and that you know the cosmos hub is that kind of interchain neutrality platform what what does neutrality mean here? And and is do you think guys think that is that important? And is it is the Cosmos Hub actually a neutral platform? I mean, given that you know it's it's in, in the end controlled by atom holders. It's neutral in that you know it the validator set and the atom holders are spread across like five different continents or six different continents with in a number of jurisdictions in fact and including a number of anonymous validators which is really cool and so you know it gives that level of like uh jurisdictional arbitrage there where it's hard for you know all the major tech companies are mostly all american companies under the control of the american government and i think it would be not impossible but i think it would be harder for the american government to exert its will over the cosmos hub as a whole yeah, I, I think that's actually a, that's a really interesting question, and um, one of the things I've been thinking about is that a lot of the users of the of the Cosmos network actually will not need to hold atoms and will not really kind of take part in governance or anything. However, the difference here is that if they wanted to, they could they could buy atoms and they could take part in decentralized governance, which is what differentiates it from kind of like a Google, you know, Facebook, Apple type situation. Permissionless network. Right. Um, and is anyone here, does anyone think that transaction fees at some point will constitute significant revenues for the hub? 
I mean, I mean as, as, an, as an investor, you really hope so. <laughs> I mean, this I just mean, depends I on transaction actually, volumes. And as we see applications like DLive and Lino and some of these other platforms where microtransactions are happening, uh, gigantic volume coming onto DEXs is obviously something we really haven't seen out in the wild yet, but we are anticipating. So I do think that there's a, a pretty clear line to large transaction fees for Cosmos Hub validators. Sorry, Sunny. Yeah. Oh, no worries. I was just going to say, yeah, I think that uh, the main value is going to come from the transaction fees happening on chains that are uh, pooling securely with the Cosmos Hub. So, you know, even if there's not enough, a lot of volume on the Cosmos Hub specifically, you know, the, the transaction fees from all of the chains that are being shared security with the Cosmos Hub all generally flow to the Cosmos Hub validators. And so that's kind of what the, where most of the value is going to come from. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely I agree with you both. I think one of the you know D lives really interesting, and one of the questions there is, you know, if you have you know millions of users on D live doing all sorts of things, why are they going to want to move um, their digital assets on D live onto the Cosmos Hub? Like, what are they going to be doing? And I think the reality is like we don't really know yet, but you have to have some kind of belief that there will be desire to do that. I don't know if you guys have more insight. Well, when people, I think when humans create economic value in one area, they're going to want to transfer it to another. And like, we, we will see this in games, like large gaming platforms with NFTs, people will want to move value in and out of that space. Obviously the heavy users of the game who are creating a lot of these NFTs and like finding these different tokens and stuff, will want to sell them to, to new users who don't have them. And they'll want to take those off chain or whatever but yeah I, I do think there's there will be use cases where folks would want to move value on and off of a platform like d live yeah um i mean maybe just on the transaction fee point i kind of disagree on this i mean if, if you look at it so far right there's actually no blockchain ever at any point had large revenues from transaction fees and uh, I kind of make, huh? You disagree? I'm unfamiliar with the order of magnitude of how high Bitcoin, Bitcoin transaction fees reached as a percentage of total miner rewards. I would say maybe 10%. I, I'm not sure, but like, I, I mean, it, it did. So you're right, right? Like, so Bitcoin transaction fees did uh, achieve a certain volume, but what were the effects of that? I mean, or why did it uh, reach those levels? Well, because blocks were full, right? And you had to like wait ages to, you know, get your transaction in and then you bid on it. Now that, that mechanism could work for the Cosmos Hub in theory too. But of course the big issue is the usability of the Cosmos Hub is like falling apart if that's the case, right? If you have to wait maybe like whatever, 20 minutes to get your transaction in unless you pay a lot. So I don't think that works, right? There's a way of extracting value. That's and true. so, sorry. Huh? Okay. Continue. Sorry, sorry, sorry. yeah, so, mm -hmm. so, I mean, this is a, a problem I've thought about for many years, uh, mm -hmm. also in, you know, Bitcoin and other chain, it's not cosmos specific thing and, you know, kind of where my, and, and I, I actually think it's a, it's one of the really powerful thing of blockchains that you can fund the operation of a blockchain through block rewards instead of transaction fees, mm -hmm. because it makes everyone's the user experience is so much better. Um, but it, it does raise an interesting question, right? Like how do you, you know, how does the hub capture value? I, I kind of see two, two different ways here. When it comes to transaction fees, I, I would think that the only way that you can, one, maintain the usability of the hub and two, potentially capture some different transaction fees would be that you actually have to kind of enforce some you know minimum on the governance level right like governance has to vote and it's like okay a, a transaction on the cosmos hub costs like this much um and you know i'm sure there will be people crying like oh it's not, it's not a free market or something but like I, I think it's it's something that doesn't work otherwise well, uh it's already implemented right now oh no now you can have zero that's because so so um so, so, so the reason that no tra no chain has ever had uh, can fund by transaction fees is because every chain has only really done this like first pass first, first 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 price auction for transaction fees with no minimum. 
in Cosmos Hub, the idea is that there will be a minimum fee required. And what's currently there is that each validator can set the minimum fee that they want to pay. Um, but, uh, this will shift into a model where it's actually in consensus through uh, min fee. And um, I have a paper uh, that kind of- you mean, you mean you would like it to shift into this model or? I would like it to shift into this model. And I have a paper that kind of- It's presumably that. not the czar of Cosmos who can decide that, right? Not yet, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you talk uh, about like, oh, I will shift this into this. <laughs> right. But, but the, 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 the problem here is that in the current system is Polychain seems to be accepting uh, zero fee transactions, which I don't quite understand why. Uh, and so the, the pro yeah, so that's the problem here right now, which is why zero fee transactions are going through. But like rationally, I think validators should probably set their min fee. Min fee well, to I well think in right the now, early stage of the network, yeah. people can't transfer atoms. The only way to create a validator is to get somebody to give you one atom and then send a zero fee transaction. So I, I think in order to facilitate that, a number of network operators are trying to help out. Yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, I think right now, zero fee transaction, that's perfectly fine. I don't see any issues with that, right? This is like a long term thing. Yeah. Uh, but but when it comes to shared security, I, I mean, you know, Stanley, you mentioned, okay, what you would see is then the uh, Cosmos hub kind of earns transaction fees and all these zones, but I actually don't think that's the way it would have to work. I think the way it would have to work is you have some zone that Cosmos hub secures. The zone has its own token, and that token then basically pays a block reward to uh, to the validator set for, for validating that. Uh, and yeah, yeah, I mean, th these are both possible. And the nice thing about how my proposed security model works is it allows for this like full range of design space where like zones can figure out how to incentivize the validators themselves. They could do like, you know, block awards if they of their own token, if they wanted to, they could do transaction fees if they wanted to. And, you know, the, the shared security model that uh, Zach and I are working with right now, it's much more, um, uh, Hayekian like this, then like, you know, in Polkadot, for example, there's only this, or the only incentivization really is, you know, to lock up the dots and like, you know, I guess the locking up of dots in order to secure a parachain slot is supposed to be what incentivizes the validators. So, um, yeah, so this is kind of like, you know, I, I, I think, I think we'll see a lot of different like exploration on how to incentivize the Cosmos validators to validate. What do you mean by Hayekian? Hayekian. Obviously. Of or pertaining to Hayek, but how so? Uh, because in the current shared security models that are being proposed by ETH 2.0 and by Polkadot, uh, I think it makes a bit more sense for ETH 2.0, but what they're basically saying is that, look, here's a pool of a lot of validators, let's say a thousand, for example, and then the protocol will say, okay, you 50 or you have to do this parachain, you 50 have to do this parachain, you 50 have to do this parachain, and so on. Um, while you know, and the, it, while the Cosmos Hub, you know, my proposed model is that a chain shows up to the Cosmos Hub and says, hey, I want to be validated. Who can validate me? And each individual validator can individually decide whether or not to validate that chain. And that will create a system where there's some chains that maybe have 10 validators, but some that have hundreds. And that's okay because, you know, this is a this is an allocative efficient like an efficient allocation of security because some chains just simply don't need that security right like the crypto kitties chain clearly does not need the equivalent security to the maker chain and the crypto yeah. kitties people are overpaying for security otherwise and so this hayekian yeah. approach where it allows each validator to individually decide what's best for their use what what's best for them will actually lead to an overall efficiency of allocation Yes, yeah, so like validators are independent economic actors and should be treated yeah. as such instead of being centrally planned. Exactly. Okay, so I, I would say we maybe can take a little bit more. And as we, I would say this, this last part, what I would be curious about, so, you know, the Cosmos Hub was launched and you had to make some choices for, you know, the parameters. Right. And then, of course, there was very little information to make those choices on. Right. So to a large extent, they were just sort of, you know, guesses. Right. Well, OK, we start with an inflation rate of 70 percent, a 7 percent, maybe goes up to a cap of 20 percent, change a certain rate. We target a 67 percent bonded, you know, the 5 percent slashing. You know, there are I don't know how many, maybe a dozen or so, uh, maybe more 
of these parameters that were chosen. And you know, I'm sure many of them will end up have been suboptimal or maybe probably all of them. So I'm curious, and then of course it's very early and you know, probably it's too early to make any changes there. Uh, but does any one of you feel, or like how do you guys feel about the parameters that were chosen? And are there particular ones that you already feel, okay, these should be changed? So, so, so I, I'm, what, what I'm interested in actually is in the bonding periods. Uh, you know, so at the moment it's three weeks and, and I wonder whether, you know, let's say um, atoms start trading and they start trading at some crazy high price, whether we suddenly see a massive run of, of people unbonding all at the same time and whether that's a risk for the security of the network. And, and an alternative might be if, you know, the more people that want to unbond, maybe it changes the time of unbonding and it's the, the bonding period is kind of dynamically adjusted. That's just just a, just an idea. Yeah, so the I mean, that would help. That is, it changes the security model a lot, especially because the bonding period is very uh, unbonding period is imp is important to the security of IBC because it's the minimum length as to which um, or and just to like clients and every, and nodes in general, where it's, it's the minimum length at which you have to check into the blockchain, and if that's dynamic based off of things that are happening in the blockchain, that heavily just changes the security design of like clients and IBC and whatnot. So you, you like, you know, you want the, the client, the, the, like the foundation, the rock on which you like base all of your, like, you know, the one constant that should remain true through all of time is that unbonding period where you know that as long as you check in once every three weeks, you are safe in the network. And so you don't want that to fluctuate because the whole point is that you might not be following the network. And so you don't know what the unbonding period has changed to. That's a that's a really interesting point, Sonny, and, and totally accurate <laughs> from a security model standpoint. It, it might be interesting to see a zone try something like this. It does offer potentially interesting economic incentives, like coupled with a very high inflation number where a lot of people are locking up tokens, which would result in a very low liquid supply. Like this is another thing that would keep that supply very illiquid. So um, in, in, in just an interesting thought experiment. So, I mean, to go into general about like the parameters in general, um, there's a, uh, so my second favorite podcast after Epicenter, of course, is uh, there's a podcast called Planet Money uh, from NPR. And it's like an amazing podcast. I highly recommend anyone listen to it. It just, and it just, they just talk about like random economics topics or just general topic, really interesting topics in, in general, like maybe in economics, but one of the more, definitely more economics focused ones was, you know, they were talking about like how the Fed chooses interest rates, and you know they they, they had this one section. Uh, you know they basically like you know how do they choose this two percent interest rate that they kind of target? They're like, eh, feels right. They're like, all right, yeah, could, we we all decided it felt right. All right, let's go to lunch now. Uh, and so you know even the way that like the Fed chooses interest rates for the United States, like dollar and like thus the entire world is just this like very ad hoc, it feels right system. So uh, just wanted to throw that out there, but you know, more specifically about the Cosmos Hub specific uh, parameters and specific, you know, I agree a lot of these things that we chose right now just felt right. right? And, like, you know, 7%, 20%, these are just like random numbers that we just made up. Um, and so we kind of, but the problem is in proof of stake, we just literally don't have enough data right now. I don't think there's been any like legitimate proof of stake chain that has like launched with like proper slashing incentives and whatnot. And so because of that, constant, we, we had no empirical data with which to base our decisions off of. So we had nothing to go off of other than it felt right. But uh, well, I also other than our experience in the test nets too. Right, exactly. Yeah, game of stakes and test nets and stuff definitely helped as well. Um, and so going forward, as we, as we get more data, real world data from the Cosmos Hub, as well as from Iris and from other chains, other proof of stake systems, we'll have more empirical data off of which to better choose our parameters. Yeah, I mean, personally, I, I mean, of course, also many of you or some of you will be aware of this. I'm sure that once 
you here, but some of the listeners probably too, there, there was actually the very first governance proposals already about changing one of the parameters. So that was that there was an assumption that the uh, block time would be five seconds. And then in reality, it, end up, it ends up being between six and a half and seven seconds. So it means basically that the inflation that would have been paid out, the block reward would be paid out every five seconds, was instead paid out more slowly and the actual inflation rate was lower, right? So that's that's one thing that was already the very first governance proposal uh, by B Harvest uh, was about changing that. And that's already been accepted and, and is being changed. Um, so, but overall, I've actually been, you know, I, I feel the parameters chosen have been pretty good. One thing that, you know, there is a, is a question around it is, you know, there is this mechanism of the inflation increasing when less than 67% are bonded. Uh, but that is happening very, very, very slowly. So if this is actually meant, so the, it's not a very powerful tool in a way to, you know, kind of incentivize that mechanism. I think if it was to do that, it would have to act, you know, much more quickly. And, you know, maybe the inflation rate would go from 7% to 20% within three months instead of now, uh, you know, it will be multiple years. Um, what are you guys thoughts on that? Is, is that something that should be made a bit more like dynamic? I think yes, personally. I mean, in part, I think it really depends on what the, like specifying the goals, you know, when, when the Fed's thinking about whether it should be 2% and then going for lunch, you know, there are so many intricate goals that they're trying to, um, you know, trying to kind of optimize for. And so here, I think it's, it's also the case here. It's like, well, you know, 67%, like how important is it that we get, you know, a significant number of atom states. Like, I think it's actually really important because actually what is the the whole point to me of the Cosmos network is the shared security. And so if people aren't bonding atoms, then like that's kind of a, a large degree of the, the point of the network is is not working. Um, so yeah, I, but, but then also it's kind of tough in particularly in decentralized governance for the decentralized crowd to collectively determine exactly what the goal they're trying to optimize for is. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, this echo, those thoughts doesn't seem about right to me. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I think that's a, that's a great point, right? And that, that 67% is another figure, which is sort of, okay, <laughs> somewhat arbitrary. Um, yeah. and, and it's a very, very high figure, right? Like if you think about it, then, you know, if the Cosmos hub has and if you think about it game theoretically, the cost of attacking the Cosmos hub, you know, is going to be just enormous. Even 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 if this five percent uh, slashing penalty, and, and if that's increased, so it could certainly be lower. But then again, that ties into the question: what's what actually will be done with these atoms? Uh, you know, is there some sort of shared security? Is there some other other function about it? And I guess it's you know too early to. Yeah, totally. Um, cool. Well, a anything else that you guys want to address for we wrap um, up? One of the things that Zaki and I have been pretty interested in lately is like, you know, creating some community initiatives around deploying zones. So, you know, the, like we're going back to the whole thing where, you know, the Cosmos Hub, uh, the Atom Holders is a DAO, right? And so, you know, from the DX DAO episode, the idea was that the DX DAO would continue to deploy more dApps. Currently, they're running this, uh, the DX out. Oh, no, not the DX out. Uh, it's called the, whatever the name of the exchange. Dutch is. Exchange. Dutch X. X, yeah, Dutch X, yeah. Um, and so, but over time, we'll deploy more applications as well. That, so I think the Cosmos, it'll, you know, it'll be nice to have like the Cosmos Hub Validator, like, you know, people come to the Cosmos Hub Validator set and say, hey, can you validate our change? But I think it'll be also really cool to have the Cosmos Hub Validator set validators at, or the atom holders as a DAO basically say, oh, here's a new chain we want to deploy and let's like start deploying it. And like, so I think, it'll, you know, and I think so, you know, AIB Tendermint, we proposed one idea, which was this photon hard spoon. And so, but, you know, this is really up to the community of whether they want to execute on this or not. And so just to see more like, 
initiatives from the atom holders as a decentralized community of like let's deploy like you know one thing i would really love to do is let's create a proof of work coin where like it's a it's a tenderman proof of work where like you know the distribution of the coin is done by a cosmos sdk proof of work module but it's still with uh tenderman cons consensus so proof of stake for consensus and proof of work for distribution. And so if anyone who knows me, like I've always been a proponent of this, where like, I think that proof of work is necessary for distribution. Proof of stake doesn't work for money distribution. So, you know, if, maybe the Cosmos, cu currently Cosmos doesn't, you know, a lot of projects are trying to make a play for being money, right? Cosmos currently doesn't have a play for that. Uh, maybe the Cosmos atom holders want to make a play for that. And I think maybe that's one thing they could start to do or, I don't know, just something or like, you know, some, something like the community. I want to, I want to get, I want the community to get riled up and like towards like, you know, up, till, up until now we've had this like mission of launch as this like coordinating aspect for like the entire community to like, and, and right now it's like enabling transfers, but like, I think what can we do beyond just the Cosmos hub as a decentralized community? So I think I think the slight challenge there, Sonny, is that you really need individuals to spearhead these initiatives and to kind of just say, oh, the community is going to come out. Well, like, I don't really see that. I, I see you need like one or two people, in which case, isn't that just the same as someone coming and saying, hey, I'm looking for more validators? Um, yes, but like, you know, someone can propose something, but like it could really be like taken over by the community to actually like coordinate and run it, for example, right? Like, yeah. Well, okay, I think about these things. Proposed it and maybe we'll help write some code for it at some point, but like, you know, we don't want it's, we don't want to be the ones who like coordinating the launch and everything, right? It's like, you know, it, it, we, we have this like decentralized system where people can use for coordination. Like, let's see if we can use that to coordinate the launch of new platforms. Yeah. I, I think that that's that's totally right. Um, I just forgot what I was going to say, but uh, to your point that these are decentralized systems that are meant to coordinate decentralized collaboration, I think we need to bring the barrier to entry down to be able to enable the running of more of these experiments. Because like each one of these new zones is going to be an experiment, and the initial validators who are signing on are in there for the risk. So like each experiment is going to have a different risk profile. It's going to draw in different validators. And like mm -hmm. the way to ensure that as many of these experiments get run as possible is to make the tooling better and better. Like it's almost like a bar raising. Like one of these things is the community coming together to raise this zone. So like how do we build a zone raisers kit or something like that? Like, um, raise, raise the community raising a bar and it's like raising a zone. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I don't, I don't hate that. Um, but uh, my. My last ask is a little bit more pragmatic. Um, <clears throat> right now, the tooling for validators to do reporting, as well as delegators to do reporting, i.e. to track properly track gains for each of their bonds, is a little bit suboptimal. Um, so I'm doing some work to go around and chat with validators and see what their reporting requirements are. If anyone's watching this, you are a validator, you're having trouble with reporting, please reach out to me. I'd like to hear what your requirements are so that we can hopefully get them in the software. So that's my my last little piece there. Oh, so you mean that you can, this is about querying uh, Gaia for like more data that's useful than to have analytics and dashboards and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, well, because right now when you withdraw your commissions, the only thing that's in the message is withdraw my commission to my wallet. Yeah, no, that is definitely, <laughs> that's definitely an issue. <laughs> yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah, very low level, kind of boring. No one wants to talk about it, but everyone needs it. So uh, if you guys, have some requirements, like some specific formats that you'd like to see these reporting things in. Try to think about what actions you're taking on the blockchain and how those would map, how those would ideally map into your reporting um, infrastructure. And if you guys can get to me with any requirements, I'm trying to talk to as many folks as I can about this before we make a decision on something. Cool. Well, then I would say thanks so much, everyone, for coming on. That was lots of fun. Uh, Chef, I repeat this. And uh, yeah, I think this is there's going to be many, many more of these discussions. There's just so much work to do. So uh, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, absolutely. Brian, thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks, Brian.